Okay, you're watching the CTO Advisor on the road, the CTO Advisor road trip. I'm joined with a CTO Advisor alum, Luke Norris, founder of Faction. Welcome back to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. And thanks for coming to Colorado. You know, you don't have to twist my arm, man. This is, <laughs> as you can see, this is this is beautiful. It's, uh, we're amongst the clouds. I, I don't know if I've seen any clouds that were more super. Super is a topic. We're, we're, we're amongst the super clouds. So I wanted to talk to you about the topic of super clouds. Our friends over at the Cube have coined this term super clouds. I, I'm sure that uh, version 2.0 is going to be mega super cloud or what Edge super the 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 uh so for the our audience that hasn't been following the conversation let's recap what what is super cloud as, as you understand it it's a loose definition right now oh for sure yeah i think the genie's out of sort of the bottle when it comes to the brand super cloud uh, i think it's been in multiple affirmations uh, from cross-cloud services at VMware. And it's really this idea of abstracting the individual APIs and functions of each of the public clouds and making it a combined solution or service. Um, we obviously have our own take on that that still makes it uh, a multiple cloud solution. You're still working unique functions in one cloud, unique functions in another cloud. The apps aren't truly spanning. It's just making it easier to actually operate multiple apps running siloed in multiple clouds. So I think the Wikibon folks would argue that it's the complete opposite. It is abstracting the lower level functions of each cloud to provide kind of a single API. The, the use case they like to give is Snowflake, mm -hmm. the, of how Snowflake takes each individual cloud normalizes it and then presents their solution via their super cloud. I, I love the Snowflake example. So in that example individually, you need individualized compute in Amazon. You need a separate data store in Amazon to run that Snowflake instance. And then in Azure, you would have compute in Azure and a separate distinct data set in Azure that you would then have to replicate and actually keep in synchronized with the Amazon one if you wanted to use applications and services across them. So you're saying that SuperCloud is just an extension of what we call, you know, when uh, the, I've had this conversation with you guys before, when we're talking about multiple clouds being able to normalize operation across multiple clouds, this is simply normalizing operations within multiple clouds versus making an application and data available across multiple clouds. That's correct. Now, I think this is absolutely needed. I love the fact it's actually getting a tremendous upswell and attention and people are now taking notice of it, but it still doesn't allow for an application or service to span multiple clouds simultaneously. To do that, the first thing is data and data gravity. You have to have a single data set so that you can have an application A in one of the clouds and application B in one of the clouds accessing that same data set in real time. And that's the only way to actually span those. And then B, you actually have to have Amazon, Microsoft, and Google talk to each other as if they are one cloud. And it's our fixed fabric that actually entangles that, allows us to do that. So we're going to go into the fabric a, a little bit, but I, I want to drill into this use case around using data across clouds. One of the arguments for super cloud is that it's not only a technology innovation, but it's a business enabler. Like you can do different things that you can't do uh, with the traditional multiple cloud approach. As we're thinking multi-cloud, mm -hmm. this ability to access data across multiple cl cloud providers, how is that changing? Or give me examples of how that's changed business outcomes. So we're seeing some really interesting business outcomes. Uh, uh, across the spectrum of industries. Uh, the one that we always talk about is genomics research, the fact that Amazon and Microsoft and Google have different AIML engines, the fact that they can actually have different trained models that they've spent nearly billions of dollars on. And if you put all your data in Google, you're using Google's already trained model that they've spent this you know, enormous amount of money on, but you're also missing that innovation of that model being trained by the enormous innovation of Azure, the enormous innovation of AWS. Or you could copy the petabytes and petabytes of data across all of those to try to achieve that. It's not uh, 
business feasible. Um, so that having that one data set and then taking advantage of all of that, you know, functionality features and, and really innovation that they've built into their already pre-trained classical models is a massive uh, business outcome. We're also just seeing really cool use cases. There's a, um, uh, a, a real simple business outcome. There's a uh, shipping company that literally uh, takes a picture every time uh, a box is delivered, and they have an AI ML model that will actually say, hey, that box was put at the right address under an awning, and the box is fully intact, or it's damaged, or it has any other stuff. If it's damaged, it'll automatically kick off a, a ticket. It will actually get a, a shipment received. They will actually have the person come back and pick up the box. So you can actually drive full supply chain and other features and functionalities when you start pairing all these cool AI ML models together. So I, I get I get the business outcome part of it. I mean, I can do some amazing things. I, I can even bring in my Snowflake yeah, uh, example to leverage this type of capability. But the first thing that comes to my mind is egress. Like the reason why we don't do this is because of egress charges. I, the there's providers on the market that give me a single control plane for my data across multiple clouds. But every time I go to implement one of these types of business outcomes, I get killed for egress charges and it, it mitigates any uh, business benefit I would have gotten. Um, so what we've seen is the egress is a little FUD in our mm. mind. First off, if you truly do have multiple copies of that data in multiple clouds, then synchronizing that is an egress killer. That's impossible, because the mm -hmm. amount of data that is constantly having to be rewritten across all of them. If you have that one copy of data, it's read into the cloud, and only the output is actually written back to that one copy of data. And that's a fraction. We're talking one billionth of typically the amount of data that's read in is actually written in these, any egress, uh, sorry, in any batch process like AIML, uh, uh, EDM, ADAS systems, the writes, the actual outputs from those models and from those things is a fraction of the actual intake of data. Last, a lot of the providers are starting to just remove egress fees. Azure with their express route local, completely zero egress. We're also seeing limitations and fixed egress at AWS and Google these days. So so we hit on a couple of uh, topics that I want to expand upon on some additional content. One, I want to di dive into this AI ML use case. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to go to the light board and do that. That'll Follow the link fun. in the video to the light board to have that conversation because I want you to draw this out for me. And the other one, I'm actually having a panel that at, at VMware Explorer that goes deeper into some of these topics. I'm going to have a uh, VP from AVI, Genomics Research, yeah. and then uh, Rebecca Weekly, a VP from Cloudflare who runs hardware at Cloudflare, and Cloudflare is pushing the industry to kind of get rid of egress and charge, uh, change these issues. So I want to continue this conversation, but we're going to get a little bit more technical. You're a founder, so I expect you to be able to, you know, talk, geek talk, this has been high level, <laughs> this has been high level, uh, executive level, but we're going to go one layer deeper in our next conversation. Sounds great. If you want to learn more about the CTO Advisor, you can find us on the web, thectoadvisor.com. If you have questions for me or Luke, at me on Twitter, DMs are open. We can have an extended conversation. You want to find out more about Faction, you can follow them on the web, factioninc.com. Talk to you next CTO Dose video.